Hello, my name is Celia Halsey, and I've been working with CW Plus, the charity that supports this hospital, to look at their archives and records, and to discover something about the 300 year history of this hospital. Last year, we were able to open an exhibition down in the lower ground floor, in the outpatient's waiting area, and we unpacked some of those stories and we've displayed some artifacts which tell us quite a lot about the 300 year history of this remarkable hospital. Well, today I've got some pictures and objects to share with you, which I think relate to many happy memories and happy occasions in those 300 years within this hospital. And there have been many. Um, we've got photographs and artifacts which relate to events which are probably largely forgotten, have not been seen before, and I think tell a lot about the community that this hospital has always engendered, um, the community spirit. And I, it's given me great pleasure to look through them. So I hope it's going to give you pleasure too. I also hope that it's going to perhaps stir some of your own happy memories, personal ones, or even memories connected with this hospital or other hospitals which were part of the Westminster group, such as St. Stephen's Hospital, which was on this site until 25 years ago. If you, are see, if you can, and you would like to, why don't you ask a member of the ward staff for a piece of paper and a pencil or pen. And as we look through our own collection of memories, if anything jogs your memory and you'd like to jot it down, please do. And I really warmly encourage you afterwards, perhaps to think through those happy memories and see if you can jot down a few sentences of your own personal memories and share them with someone. Share them with a member of your family or a younger member, a younger generation, um, or, or with us. If it's about the hospital, we'd love to hear your memories too. So that's just something to think about. But for now, I'm going to um, show you some pictures of our own happy memories within this hospital. We have got many of them and some of them, quite a few of them, relate to fundraising. A lot of fun has been had over the years raising funds for this hospital. Until 1948, of course, it was a voluntary funded hospital um, depending entirely on charitable donations. So, first of all, in 1905, there was a grand bazaar. And my goodness me, this was quite an occasion. It ran for three days. And uh, we have in our, in our archives rather a lovely book. This is quite a large, this is the front cover of quite a large format book. It's a, almost A3 size, it's quite big. Um, and it was sold in during the Grand Bazaar of 1905 as a kind of souvenir album. It was a coffee table book. It was a book that you might purchase uh, and uh, leave, uh, leave visible in your home because it showed that you had been um, mixing with all the titled ladies of London, pretty much, because on the inside of the front cover, we have a list of all the patronesses. Now, it's too small for you to read, so um, on the size of this screen, but uh, I want to tell you that there are seven princesses who are patrons of this event, and underneath there is pe two pages of lists of names, and we have dozens and dozens of marchionesses and duchesses, and the lady this and the lady that, and all the titled ladies. And then right down towards the bottom of the list, we get a whole row of misses on the far right hand side. It's a, a lot of married ladies all of whom supported financially this event. They would have paid to have their name in this book, uh, to have your name in a list which is topped by Her Majesty the Queen, which would have been Queen Alexandra at the time, uh, wife of King Henry VII, um, was quite something and it was worth paying for. This event raised over £5,000, which when you think this is 115 years ago, that was a lot of money. Um, 
I do notice that in the list of seven princesses, we have no less than three of them are called Princess Louise. I thought that was quite amusing. So I did a bit of digging. I think, who are all these Princess Louises? Um, well, it all turns out that they're uh, members, distant members of Queen Victoria. She had such a large family. Um, the Princess of Wales was Mary of Tech. She went on to become Queen Mary, wife of George V. Um, and then her daughter was Princess Louise, daughter of Fife, and her sister-in-law was Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle. Um, and then we have another Princess Louise who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So the whole family, all the ladies of the family, were very much supporting Westminster Hospital. Now, this book is full of pages which uh, show these ladies dressing up. My goodness me, they enjoyed their dressing up for this grand occasion. Um, each stall represented a different reign of a monarch. So this is just a page in, roughly in, in towards the middle of the book. And we have the reign of King Henry IV, which was the Welsh stall. And uh, here are two of the stall holders. Um, we've got uh, Lady Georgiana Hlangatuk. Well, I guess she was Welsh, hence the theme of her stall. And this stall was selling Welsh woven materials, Welsh pottery and carving, basket work, and embroideries and lace. So, and then we have the reign of King Henry V, and they all dressed up in, in costumes of the era. It's, it's wonderful. Um, the, further on in the book, there's a page where the nurses of Westminster Hospital um, ran the flower stall as well. So lots of, lots of things to be purchased. And we're really pleased to have in our archives this copy of the Nursing Times. This is the back page of the Nursing Times, dated May the 6th, 1905. The Nursing Times was just a magazine newspaper which was sold for a small amount of money, sixpence or something. And all nurses, all working nurses, might easily have had a copy or bought it or shared their copies. And it gave them all sorts of information and job adverts as well for nurses. But on the back page, we have off duty among the chief amusements for the coming week. So this is amusements that nurses might like to, to um, enjoy in their time off duty. And down here at the bottom of the right hand side, we've got an, sort of a little notice about this bazaar. And it was held on May the 23rd, 24th and 25th in 1905. The Bazaar in Aid of Westminster Hospital promises to be both grand and historical. It will be held in the enclosure, Dean's Yard, Westminster, and the stalls will represent by costume the reigns of the kings and queens of England. The names of the stall holders are too numerous to quote, but the list is headed by Her Royal Highness Princess Louise of Schleswig-Holstein and includes six duchesses, two marchionesses, three countesses, 27 other titled ladies and a host of names well known in the social and philanthropic world. So they really are um, rather proud of the fact they've got so many people supporting this. Um, as I say, they did raise a lot of money, uh, but I think a lot of fun was had as well. Well, we're going right back in time now to 1769, which was the 50th anniversary of uh, the hospital's founding. And I've got a picture here of Marshal Frederick Handel. And we perhaps got a piece of his most famous music. It's a piece of music which is known all over the world as Hamilton's Sire. Hallelujah, of course. So you might be wondering what on earth Handel's Messiah has to do with Westminster Hospital. Well, Around this time, Handel's music was enormously popular. And we know that for the 50th anniversary of the founding of the hospital in 1769, 
a concert was held in Westminster Abbey of Handel's Messiah uh, to raise funds for the hospital. Uh, it was also followed by a subscription dinner at the Blue Boar Inn, which was uh, in, in Westminster at the time. And uh, tickets could be had for a certain amount of money. And it was to raise funds. Handel's music went on to raise funds for the hospital for the next 15 years or so. And in the course of about uh, four years, but in the early 1780s, about four different uh, concerts of Handel's music raised over, over 5,000 pounds for the hospital, which was a huge amount of money. Um, so music has always been an important part of fundraising, having fun. But then, so have all the arts, actually. Moving right forward to um, 1924, the hospital was raising a lot of money to refurbish the building for the of the hospital, which at that time was directly opposite Westminster Abbey. And uh, they needed to uh, greatly enhance the facilities. For instance, they had no hot running water in the hospital so until 1924. So that was one of the very basic refurbishments that was needed. And they enlisted the help of someone who was then a very famous poet, Alfred Noyes. You might not have, might not be a familiar name to you now, but he wrote a very famous poem, The Highwayman, which until um, remarkably recently was a kind of poem that teachers would get children to learn by heart in the days when poetry was something that was taught by rote. Well, Alfred Noyes wrote a poem for Westminster Hospital, and this is the original manuscript we've got. Um, and it's rather charming, there's two verses, and um, he's basically personifying the qualities of the nursing and the care that went on. I'll just read the first verse. It says, within these walls, pity will war with death, conquer and fail and conquer yet again. Here many a broken life will fight for breath. Grave eyes will watch and hearts grow numb with pain. Till the new hope that makes the eyes grow blind breathes and the long suspense breaks down in tears and quiet skill, content to serve its kind, turns to new conflicts through uncounted years. I think that's rather a lovely poem, a lovely sort of picture of the nursing care and the struggles and uh, the triumphs which go on within any hospital. Well, this poem was written and published and all the proceeds from that publication went to Westminster Hospital's refurbishment programme. And at the end of their fundraising um, struggles and efforts, they, uh, well, they had to close the hospital for a year whilst the building works went on. And at the end of that, they held a solemn service of thanksgiving at Westminster Abbey. There, had, there was a long tradition of Westminster Abbey hosting events and thanksgiving services for the hospital. And there's always been a very close connection between the two institutions. So this service uh, was rather splendid and it was followed by a visit from the then Prince of Wales who briefly went on to become Edward VIII before he abdicated. Um, and he visited the hospital in November that year and took a tour. Uh, so Westminster Abbey has always been connected with Westminster Hospital. And we've got here a picture of some nurses who had been attending the coronation rehearsal at Westminster Abbey in 1937. That was the, would have been the coronation of George VI. So um, nurses have frequently always attended the grand ceremonial events taking place in Westminster Abbey. Um, every coronation has um, had a huge impact on, on Westminster Hospital between the coronation of Queen Victoria up until this coronation of George VI. And I've got here um, a little memory 
um, of one of our nurses that we uh, interviewed. We did some oral history interviews and this lady remembered being part of the nurses who were connected uh, with, the, with Westminster Hospital, with Westminster Abbey. We used to go to be on duty for in case people were ill. <laughs> yeah, when they had big, big, big services, we had little black bags with, you know, smelling salts and things like that in it. Mm -hmm. And it, when you got to be senior, you used to offer to go, go to a service or something. But, but there was a, a big connection with the Abbey and the... Um, you see, we had the chaplains. We had chaplains at the hospital. And um, I think one of them lived in the Abbey grounds, as far as I remember. Uh, well, of course, originally the hospital was over there near the Abbey, you see. The old Westminster Hospital building was in the square there somewhere. This, uh, sometimes, I didn't do very much of it, but okay. they did have people on duty as a nurse walking around with um, first aid equipment um, for any or many of the big occasions and certainly some lying in states, um, you know, when that happens. I mean, you can go as a public to see it, but we often had a nurse in uniform with a little black bag, which, left, which was kept in the office. <laughs> uh, smelling salts, yeah. Smelling salt. Well, that nurses also enjoyed those big occasions. Um, because the old Westminster Hospital was directly opposite Westminster Abbey, it was a plum spot from which to view all these big occasions, whether that's coronations or state funerals. And for many years, when there was such an occasion, um, Westminster Hospital had a kind of a wooden scaffolding system of tiered seating built on the front of the hospital. And what we have here is a picture taken in 1937 of the sisters, um, the senior nurses within the hospital, enjoying the view of King George VI's uh, coronation. And they've got their little flags and they're um, looking very um, quite pleased and happy. So they obviously managed to take a few minutes off their duties to go and wave their flags for the king uh, at the coronation. Happy occasion for all of them, I'm sure. And uh, here's another occasion when Westminster Abbey was um, the focus of an, of an event uh, marking something significant for the hospital. This is a scan of a newspaper clipping we have. In 1939, as you can see from the big poster on this front of the Westminster Hospital building, the old building was closed down and they moved to a brand new state-of-the-art hospital on St John's Gardens and uh, it was with great sadness I think that they left the old building behind but great excitement at the new facilities that they had waiting for them but to mark the move all the nurses trooped across the roads for another service of thanksgiving at Westminster Abbey and uh, it made all the newspapers And yet again, moving forward in 1966, the hospital celebrated 250 years with another grand service in Westminster Abbey. And this is uh, some photographs taken during that event. We've got um, former nurses that we have interviewed who remember this occasion and how grand it was. The Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth Queen Mother attended and it was a really special occasion. Um, they were the queen mother was greeted with a fanfare from the uh, trumpeters of the band of the royal army medical corps and there was a bronze medallion which was struck to mark the occasion and they were given to um, significant people as, as a memento of 250 years of the hospital and uh, it's rather nice on the reverse side of the of the medal, you've got a picture there of the, of the third hospital actually. It's the first hospital we have a picture of um, and it occupied this building between 1734 and 1834. Uh, and around the edge we've got the names of the four people who were the founders of the hospital. Um, you might be wondering why um, 
or very sharp and, and <laughs> spotted. You might be wondering why they celebrated 250 years in 1966. We, last year, in 2019, celebrated 300 years. Um, so what's the difference in the three years? Why not 1969? Well, that's because these four people named on this me medal actually first met in 1760. And they founded um, a charity to support the poor and the sick and the needy. Um, and they, they got going for about uh, um, under a year. And then there was a pause, and for, we're not quite sure why, and uh, all activity ceased until 1719 when they got going again and took off and the donations flooded in and they started taking patients. So at the 250th, they obviously decided to take the year 1716 as the founding year. But we took 1719 because that was the year they began to really um, receive uh, patients. So last year we celebrated the tercentenary and uh, there was another fantastic uh, service in Westminster Abbey. Uh, we commissioned this lovely banner to mark the occasion. Uh, and the day after we had a small exhibition in the hospital of some artifacts which represented different eras of the hospital. You might be wondering about the bowl of oranges. Well, uh, at that service in Westminster Abbey, uh, members of the, senior members of the nursing staff and patients associations carried that bowl of oranges up the aisle of Westminster Abbey and placed it on the altar to represent nursing care and the, all the patients of Westminster Abbey. The very first patient of Westminster Hospital, sorry. The very first patient in 1720, who was an inpatient rather than an outpatient, uh, was admitted for scurvy and was treated for that disease with oranges. And so the oranges have come to represent nursing care and the patients of Westminster Hospital. And there's a picture of the service last year and you can just see that banner um, being carried. The, the banner at the front is the banner of the old Westminster Hospital before it became the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. It was a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Well, let's move back in time again. Fun and games, because there's been a lot of serious ceremonial uh, occasions, but a lot of fun and games over the years as well. Now, this picture takes us back to 1917. It's taken at Queen, Queen Mary's Roehampton Hospital. You might be wondering, well, what's that got to do with Westminster or Chelsea and Westminster? Well, um, Queen Mary's Roehampton became part of the Westminster Group of Hospitals in 1946 until 1974. So we've got some of their archives and records, including this photograph, which was taken towards the end of World War I. Queen Mary's Roehampton was founded in 1915 to care for wounded soldiers coming back from the First World War. Uh, in particular amputees, and it became, and still is to this day, a specialist hospital specialising in the rehabilitation of people who have lost limbs and um, the development of prosthetic limbs, and it all began because of World War I. Well, in 1917, look how many patients they were caring for, and they held a sports day for these amputees, um, and this is a lineup of all the participants uh, with their wheelchairs and their crutches. It's rather poignant, but the, the kind of positive at attitude just shines out from their faces for me. They've got a little, little chap there in his Scots uniform uh, being their mascot, I think. But we also have, I'm really pleased to say, um, a photograph of the events themselves which again, I find extraordinary. It's both poignant and positive and encouraging and just so, they're so determined to have fun. This is a hopping race for amputees. Um, we have a chap who has fallen. The determination on their faces to get to that finishing line is fantastic. I think each person is being followed up and just see behind each competitor there is someone following up the rear to help them. I think this chap who's fallen is about to get some help. 
Um, but the, the sense of positivity is, I think, fantastic. In, if you like, I think of this as the very first Invictus Games, which um, Prince Harry has championed so, so well. Um, the determination to get up and get on with life after something dreadful like this has happened to you in, in the course of war. And this is also a picture taken just after the Second World War, also at Queen Mary's Roehampton. There was some kind of carnival. Um, there were prize winners, there was dressing up, there was fun and games, uh, and there was an important person coming who came around to give out the prizes. Now, I, when I first looked at this picture, I, I thought, I have, we have no idea who that is. I wonder who he was, a military gentleman. Um, as kind of befits it because it was still a military hospital or being used as such at the end of World War II. And then we also discovered this picture, which we think is taken at the same time. It's definitely at Queen Mary's Roehampton. And can you see, this is a cup, there's a silver cup on the table. Well, that was a silver cup that the front, the first um, prize winner was holding in the previous picture. And I've looked really closely at this gentleman that I think is the same military gentleman. And I've looked with a magnifying glass at his, uh, his medals and the insignia on the lapel of his collar and compared it with other photographs. And I am fairly certain that this is Field Marshal Montgomery who was supporting the hospital. The Westminster Hospital also has some uh, letters on display in our exhibition in the lower ground floor from Field Marshal Montgomery, um, little notes which he sent to the nurses at um, Westminster Hospital sending them chocolate because they so often greeted him as he was on his way to the war office uh, walking through Westminster and he was sending the nurses chocolate. The old charmer, he is lovely, uh, but he's also giving out prizes at, at this carnival. They well, Westminster Hospital has always loved its sports and games and um, the medical school at Westminster had a very active sports and social club. This um, picture of a pavilion was taken out in uh, New Eltham, Cobham, and was the sports pavilion for the Westminster medical students. And it was used also by the um, nurses by invitation. But sports was hugely important at Westminster Medal Medical School. Uh, rugby, tennis, rowing, cricket, you name it. They played it, squash, uh, rifle shooting. It was really important in the social life of medical students. And they held a sports and social day in 1955. That was only two years after they had um, acquired this new pavilion. And, um, so that, this is a programme of the events of that Sports and Social Day in July 1955. And on the inside, um, we have a programme of events, which I think really captures a really happy day. One thing to note is that there were buses leaving Westminster Hospital um, three times, 12 noon, 1 p.m. and 1.30. So it didn't matter what shift you were on, you could probably slip away at the end of your shift and, um, catch a bus out to, the, um, out to the sports ground. And then there were buses taking you back again in the evening at various times. And so what was going on? Well, there was a tennis tournament going on all day and a cricket match, which was the Board of Governors and medical staff versus the medical students. Hmm, I wonder how that went down. I wonder who won. I bet that was a fierce rivalry. Uh, then there were a lot of races for the ladies, open 80 yards flat race. Um, there was a 220 yards flat race for the sports and social club, that's the medical students. Netball match uh, for the nurses of St George's Hospital versus the nurses of Westminster Hospital and so on. Children's races, sack races, three-legged races, and then there was the inter-hospital nurses relay race. And that included nurses from the London Hospital, St George's Hospital, Westminster Children's Hospital and Westminster Hospital. Uh, and it carried on. There was tilting the bucket competition and archery followed up by dancing and prize giving so a really and a buffet of course you've got to have food in there so what a happy day um 
we haven't found anyone who remembers this, but uh, I'm sure they had a lot of fun. Westminster Medical School also took its sport really seriously, as I said, and this great picture was taken in 1974, uh, the sporting glory days when the medical school rugby team won the coveted hospital cup. Um, apparently the London Hospital's rugby cup is the oldest con still contended rugby cup in the history of the game. Um, I'm told this is a, also a picture of the winning team with their cup. Um, I think that's an absolutely great picture. Uh, this was against St Mary's, St Mary Abbott's Hospital and uh, the chap tackling is from St Mary Abbott's and the chap with fierce concentration giving a long kick was Westminster. So his name was, his surname was Driscoll apparently. Well, lots more feasts and parties went on over the years. This is quite interesting. This is a picture from the Daily Sketch newspaper. And um, it was taken, we think, in uh, the late 1920s. And it was taken at uh, the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. There was an annual ball in aid of the Infants Hospital. Now the Infants Hospital um, became, was on Vincent Square and in 1946 uh, became Westminster Children's Hospital and came into the Westminster Group and was re renamed Westminster Children's Hospital. But at this time it was the Infants Hospital and they obviously had a large poster, I think, um, showing the hospital on Vincent Square, laid out on the floor and it was to, you had to go up into the galleries of the of the opera house and rain down coins onto the hospital so there's a shower of money raining down onto the hospital it's a sort of a fundraising activity in the course of the of the ball and the entertainment well, here's a splendid dinner um, this is a gathering of westminster hospital old students in 1936 at the trocadero restaurants in London in September 1936. Now I think this is really quite interesting. Yes it's a quite a stiff formal dinner but being the hospital old students 1936 I've carefully counted there are I think only 10 women in this picture of old students. Women were admitted for the first time to Westminster Medical School to train to be doctors in 1916 during first world, first world war when the numbers applying to be doctors plummeted obviously because of the war so they admitted women and they allowed women to train as doctors until 1928 when um, numbers of applicants were up again and it, i suppose in the sort of feelings of the time it was felt that the men needed the jobs and women were barred in 1928, which is curious. It's just the year that women got full suffrage and were allowed to vote. That was the year that um, women were no longer allowed to train as doctors at Westminster. So these 10 women in 1936 would have trained between 1916 and 1928. Um, women were readmitted again in 1948 uh, at the start of the NHS. So, um, that's quite interesting but these were pioneering women they, they were few and far between at that time and the children they're not forgotten they need a party too they need to celebrate Christmas in particular um, these two pictures I've put alongside each other because I'm not sure but I think they're taken at the same same occasion um, or certainly the same type of occasion there was clearly some kind of Christmas party um, the Christmas tree, which has just been set up by two nurses and the gentleman in the mid middle was somebody called Tom Goldsmith. He was the chief porter uh, for many, many years at the old Westminster Hospital. And uh, apparently he ruled the outpatients department with a rod of iron. He, was, he, he ran a tight ship as chief porter, but he was also responsible for putting up the Christmas tree and decorating it. And he looks quite pleased with himself there. But I think this is the same Christmas tree, and it's certainly the same place 
of the other picture of a children's party and the accordion player entertaining all the children. I can't quite work out what that event was. It's definitely within the hospital, but that looks like far too many children to be um, the, the, the patients. They only had two children's wards, so that's far too many for them to be patients. And anyway, they're all fully dressed. They're not, they don't look like patients. So whether it was a, just a community party for the local children around Westminster, I'm not sure, but it looks like they're really enjoying themselves. I'm gonna sing along. And this is a really old photograph. I think this is taken from the 1890s. Uh, it's the inside of Westminster Hospital in the old setting opposite Westminster Abbey. Um, and again, I've looked really closely and I know it's Christmas because on the far back wall, you can just see wishing all a Merry Christmas, a banner on the back wall. Lots of pot plants, lots of aspidistras and foliage uh, all laid up and the streamers and the banners. And this is the chaplain, the chap standing in the dark um, cassock on the right hand side was the chaplain of the hospital. And lots of children all lined up. I think it I'm not sure if it's the children's ward because the people in bed look to be quite elderly. It's one of those mystery photographs, but they're clearly having a party and wanting to record the occasion. Of course, Christmas always brings out the traditions and um, the nurses for many years used to sing Christmas carols around the wards on Christmas Eve with their lamps. And this one's taken from 1946 when they were um, singing their cows. It's a rather charming picture. The other Christmas tradition uh, for many years was that the surgeon on duty that day uh, got to carve the turkey because it's obviously a job for a surgeon. A slightly dark sense of humour now, I think. But this is a matron, the lady in the middle in the dark dress uh, is matron Edith Smith. This was taken in 1945. Uh, they've got a turkey and I think they're quite pleased to have a turkey. It's just at the end of the war. Uh, and that was a newspaper photograph. And this is the same chap. Um, he was uh, Mr. George McNabb. He was the chief medical superintendent throughout the war. This picture was taken in 1939, the first Christmas um, at the beginning of the war. You can see the windows have been taped, taped up uh, to protect against bomb blasts. But they've got a little tree and they're um, entertaining the children. Nurses have always tried and the hospitals have always tried to make these occasions happy times for those who are uh, being cared for. That's a sweet picture. And I want to encourage you to think about your own happy memories. I'm sure you have some. Um, what happy memories have we stirred here? Is there a sports day or a party that you remember? Um, I'm going to encourage you to just jot it down. When memories are lost, they're gone forever. You will have memories which nobody else has got. Um, and I think it can do us a lot of good sometimes just to remember those times and record them. It doesn't have to be a great work of memoir, it can just be a few sentences. What was the event? Who, who was there? That's an important part of your memory. The other people you shared it with. And really important, how did it make you feel? Not just what happened, but what did you feel at the time? Um, what funny little thing um, do you remember, which nobody else might? Uh, and what did you do at that event? And what made you happy? Was it the people there? Was it what you were doing? If you could jot those things down and put them in an envelope, give them to a member of your family, that would be wonderful. And I hope you enjoy doing that. But I also wonder whether you've got any memories of the ho this hospital. This hospital was part of a group until um, until 1993, there were a number of different hospitals around under the aegis of Westminster Hospital. And in 1993, many were, they were all amalgamated and 
the Westminster Hospital became Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and was built on the site of the old St. Stephen's Hospital. And there's a picture here of um, various hospitals which were amalgamated. You've got St. Stephen's Hospital, the black and white picture on the right hand side. Um, you can see the red brick building is um, at the top there is Westminster Children's Hospital. Uh, underneath we've got a picture, a modern day picture, of what was St Mary Abbott's Hospital. And on the left hand side we've got the front door of what was All Saints Hospital, which was the uh, uh, urinary and uh, kidney hospital. The building is now part of the Imperial War Museum, it's part of their archives, but the um, hospital amalgamated and uh, with Westminster Hospital. If you've got memories of any of these, whether they were happy times, poignant times, difficult times, um, experiences maybe as a member of staff even, or a patient, we'd love you to share them with us. Do drop, drop them down and um, there's an email address there. If you could uh, email it to us, we would love to hear them. I hope that you have found that enjoyable. I hope that you've uh, in enjoyed wandering down memory lane with us. It's been lovely sharing these happy times with you and um, I hope it's put a smile on your face. Thank you very much for sharing them with me.